Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio Detectives, where we bring to you tales from the greatest detective shows the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 926 episodes from 1934 to 1955, we bring to you Lux Radio Theater. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Merle Oberon and Walter Houston in The Letter with Ralph Forbes and Eric Snowden. Lux presents Hollywood. Our sincere thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for your loyal purchases of the products which make this program possible. Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. Tonight, we bring you Merle O'Brien, Walter Houston, Ralph Forbes, and Eric Snowden in The Letter, a grand love story, a thrilling melodrama set against the background of far-off melee. As guests, you'll hear Carveth Wells, famous author and explorer, and his wife. Our orchestra is conducted by Louis Silvers. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our play tonight ranks among the most distinguished works of one of the finest writers of our time, William Somerset Maugham whose contributions to the screen include not only the letter, but such memorable dramas as Rain, The Painted Veil, and Of Human Bondage. Educated to be a doctor, he received his degree but never practiced. He turned at once to writing and travel. The author of many great novels and more than 25 plays, he served during the war in the British Secret Service. Few writers have a keener appreciation of detail, and the notebooks he carries are crammed with notes so copious that Mr. Moore usually has about ten years' work planned in advance. The scene of the, of the letter is Malay, a neighbor of India, in whose city of Calcutta, Merle Oberon, daughter of a British army officer, lived for several years. Miss Oberon came to London when seventeen, determined to reach the screen. She had a hundred dollars and a steamship ticket back to India. Her money gone, she sold her ticket and wound up by working in London's Café de Paris. Bit parts and pictures later brought her to the attention of Alexander Corder and to ultimate stardom. Her screen activities today are divided between Mr. Corder in England and Mr. Samuel Goldwyn in Hollywood. Merle has taken leave of Continental Cameras for a while and soon co-stars with Gary Cooper in the Goldwyn film The Girl and the Cowboy. One of the screen's most striking beauties... Merle is slightly over five feet tall, weighs 112 pounds, has chestnut hair, hazel green eyes, and a slightly Irish tilt to her nose. Tonight she plays the role of Leslie Crosby. Walter Houston, currently starring in Of Human Hearts, is heard as Robert Crosby. Ralph Forbes becomes Jeffrey Hammond, and Eric Snowden is Howard Joyce. It's curtain time now, and the Lux Radio Theater presents Merle Oberon and Walter Houston in The Letter with Ralph Forbes and Eric Snowden. At the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula lies the city of Singapore where harbor lights wink gaily beneath the starry brightness of the tropic sky, where people of many races mingle in hopeless confusion, where rickshaws whirl through narrow, crowded streets. Singapore, the crossroad of the east. A few hours north through the mangrove swamps are the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce governed by a handful of white men. In a house on one of these plantations, a light burns softly. Although it's only ten o'clock, the windows have been screened and shuttered for the night. There's a deep silence. Suddenly, a man's laughter is heard. <laughs> and then... Miss Cosby! Miss Cosby! Miss 
Cosby, I hear some shot. It sounds like... Oh, that man. He is... Yes. He's dead, Chung. You... You shoot him, Miss Cosby? Yes, I... I killed a thief. A thief? But he was... Uh... I've killed a thief, Chung. Do you understand? He tried to break into the house and I killed him. Yes, Miss Crosby. I understand. See. You'd better call my husband. He's down in Singapore at Mr. Joyce's office. Ask him to come right away and then call the police. Police? Yes, Miss Crosby. I call. <laughs> Well, of course, if you really want to buy that plantation, I'll handle it for you. Yes, I want it, Howard. I've had my eye on it for a long time now, and I want it. Oh, just a minute, will you? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, hold on. It's for you, Bob. Me? Oh. Hello? Yes, Chung? Yes, this is Mr. Crosby. What? No, I can't hear you, Chung. Uh, speak louder, will you? What about Mrs. Crosby? She did what? Good Lord. What is it, Bob? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Uh, where is she now? Can, can she come to the phone? All right. Never mind. Tell her I'll be there just as soon as I can. Yes, yes, I'm leaving now. Is there something wrong? Yes, it's Leslie. I left her alone tonight. Someone must have broken into the house and... And she shot him. Is he dead? Yes, the police are on their way there now. I'll have to leave, Howard. Well, wait a moment. Perhaps I, I'd better come along with no, you. No, I don't think it'll be necessary. Perhaps not, but you you can never tell. Come along. You say you didn't hear a sound until you heard the shots. Is that right, Chung? Hear nothing, Sergeant. Hear nothing. Just shot. What were you doing when you heard them? Uh, cleaning teeth like they teach us Christian school. You didn't hear Mrs. Crosby scream? I didn't scream, Sergeant Jenkins. I told you. I heard this man prowling around out here in the living room. I knew it was too early for my husband to be back so and... So you uh... got the gun from your bureau drawer just as he opened the door into your bedroom and ended. Did you say anything to him or he to you? Not a word. He saw me standing there with the gun and, and started towards me. So, so I pulled the trigger. You didn't say anything? I should think you'd have said then, up or stop or something. Even though he was a stranger. I tell you, I never saw him before. No offense, Mrs. Crosby. I must say you were pretty cool about the whole thing. Good nerves. There wasn't much time to be anything but cool. He must have been a cool person himself. Look here. Poured himself a glass of liquor from the decanter there. Here's the glass, half full. How do you know he used it? Unless you were a bit to steady yourself, Mrs. Crosby. I? Oh... Oh, no. I wonder why he didn't drink it all. Huh. I suppose that's your husband, Mrs. Crosby. It must be. Leslie. Leslie. Leslie, darling. Here, Robert. Oh, Leslie. God, I, I shouldn't have left you alone. Don't worry, Robert. I'm quite all right. Now that you're here. Evening, Sergeant. Well, hello there, Mr. Joyce. Now, don't get that intent expression, Jenkins. I'm not here on business. Mr. Crosby was in my office when the call came. I just came along with him. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Joyce. I know you don't have to chase your law cases. <laughs> Thank you, Jenkins. Well, everything's settled, I guess. Except the man's identification. The man broke in, Mrs. Crosby heard him, and... Well, she's a mighty steady shot, Mr. Crosby. Yes, thank God. And the first night I've been away for months. You're usually here, Mr. Crosby? Certainly. I've been here every night for the last three months. What do you mean, Sergeant? Me? Oh, I was just wondering if he had any way of knowing that you were going to be away tonight. It could have been chance, couldn't it? He must have been a patient man if he's been on the lookout all these months, waiting until you were gone, Mr. Crosby. If you mean that Mrs. Crosby was waiting for me to be gone... Oh, Robert! Please, the sergeant implied nothing like that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, sergeant. <laughs> I was just going to say that if he'd been waiting all this time, he surely didn't know Mrs. Crosby was such a wildcat. Uh, oh, uh, uh, pardon me, Mrs. Crosby, I... I mean, such a good shot with a gun. You've no idea who the man is, Sergeant? Not yet. We'll tag him, though, when we get the body down to headquarters. I imagine I know as many people as anybody around here. May I see him? If you want to, sir. He's in that room over there. 
Why does he have to be identified? Don't you believe he was a thief? Why, certainly, Leslie. No, she means why do any more tonight? I think she's gone through enough already. If Mr. Joyce can identify him, it'll be less bother for Mrs. Crosby. The inquest will be held sooner. The inquest? Don't you believe my story? The inquest is only a formality, Mrs. Crosby. Certainly we believe your story. You'll just have to tell it to Mr. Bentley, the coroner, that's all. Uh, You don't mind if they go in, Leslie? No. No, of course not. I'll have a look at him myself. You stay here, dear. Uh, Right in here, sir. Now, there he is. Now, if you'll stand over this way, you can see his face a little better. Well, Mr. Joyce? Hmm. Yes, I know him all right. Who is he, Howard? His name's Hammond. Jeffrey Hammond. Hammond? Hammond? Jeffrey Hammond. Hmm. And what do you know about him, sir? Very little. I, I talked with him for a while in my office the other day. Ong, my assistant, sent him in. Was this Hammond in trouble? No, nothing to do with a criminal case. Just a slight matter of property, that's all. Hey, Quite you all. You don't suppose that he might have seen me there and, and got the idea for the robbery then? Did he ask any questions about Mr. Crosby? No, I don't think Hammond saw Mr. Crosby. Well, if Ong knows him, he can come to make the identification and save you the trouble, Mr. Joyce. We'll hold the inquest at ten tomorrow in Singapore. You'll see that your wife is there, Mr. Crosby? Yes. I'll drive her down myself. It won't take long, darling. The sergeant said it was just a formality. We'll be in there a few minutes and... And we'll be on our way back by noon. Yes. Yes, we will, won't we? What's the matter, dear? Nothing. Nothing. It's so hot and I'm I'm tired. I'm so desperately tired, Robert. Yes, I know you are. I wish there was something I could do to help you. But there doesn't seem to be a thing. You can love me, Robert. (laughs) Why, I've always done that. Yes. But now I need your love more than ever. Leslie, you're making this thing much more important than it really is. I can't help it. It isn't easy to forget that that you've killed a man. Leslie, uh, You don't blame me, do you? Blame you? For killing a thief? He might have killed you first. Yes. Yes, he might. What'll they do to me? Just ask a few questions, that's all. I'd like to see anyone try to do anything to you. People will talk, won't they? I hate the idea of everyone talking about me. Whatever they say, you'll, you'll never believe anything against me, will you? But what could they say? I don't know. You heard the sergeant last night. He he seemed to imply that that I'd invited that man. People are so unkind sometimes. They'll say anything. Leslie, look at me. You're my wife and I love you. And because I love you, I also trust you. Wouldn't be much of a love if I didn't. Do you suppose I'd believe gossip against what you've already told me? No. Thank you, Robert. Now, come on. We're going in there and get this over with. And then we're going home. Let me help you out, darling. Do I look that bad? Well, you look a little pale. Don't worry. I'll be rosy cheeked and merry when I come back. Of course you will. Good morning, Leslie. Oh, good morning, Howard. Oh, hello, Howard. I I thought Jenkins said you didn't have to come to the inquest. Oh, I just thought I'd come along to lend a hand if I could. Is there anything wrong? No, but Coroner Bentley is apt to waste time on occasion. Well, I hope he won't today. Well, your hopes are dashed. He's put the inquest back an hour already. Why? You'll have to ask Bentley that. You run along inside, Bob. I want to talk to Leslie for a moment. But why does Leslie need a lawyer? I'm playing doctor, not lawyer. You're so nervous, you're making Leslie nervous. Now, go ahead. Oh, well, all right. And I'll, I'll see you right after the inquest, darling. Well, Howard? How do you feel? Very well. Why? Leslie, I, I don't want to pry into your business, but is there anything you'd like to speak to me about? <laughs> I thought you wanted to speak to me. Well, just to ask you that. Are you sure there's nothing you'd like to tell me before we go in there? What should there be to tell? Nothing, I guess. Just keep your head and don't let them... And that's all you have to tell us, Mrs. Crosby. That this man Hammond forced an entry and that you shot him. Yes, that's all. May I go now, Coroner? Just a few more routine questions, Mrs. Crosby. Just a few more routine questions. Are you going to keep her here all day? Oh, Bob, sit down. Mr. Crosby, while this inquest may seem a trifle informal to you, please remember that this is still His Majesty's court. My husband is worried about me because of last night, Mr. Bentley. Go on, please. Mrs. Crosby, 
Do you recall that last night Sergeant Jenkins called your attention to the fact that this man Hammond had evidently poured some of the liquor from the decanter into the glass? Yes. Sergeant Jenkins remarked that he must have been rather cool to take the time. On the other hand, he might have felt in need of a stimulant and poured himself the glass for that reason. Yes, very possibly. Oh, what difference does that make? Mr. Crosby, for any more interruptions, I must ask you to leave. Mrs. Crosby, I shall come to the point. I wish to ask why your fingerprints were also upon that glass. <laughs> Quiet. Well, Mrs. Crosby? I see no reason why my prints shouldn't be there. Clean glasses take fingerprints as well as used glasses. It's, uh, it's probable that sometime during the day I arranged the glasses to, uh, to make a more orderly appearance on the tray. Yes, yes, that is possible. Sergeant Jenkins didn't happen to think of that. But you see, Mrs. Crosby, when Sergeant Jenkins examined the prints upon the glass, after he brought it down here to headquarters, he was struck by the peculiar fact that your prints and Hammond's prints were found in such a position that it led him to believe that he had handed the glass to you or you to him. You seem to be very sure they were my fingerprints, Mr. Bentley. Well, we don't know that, of course, Mrs. Crosby. It would be only in case of an arrest that we'd take them. Then you think that I perjured myself here? I ask only for any explanation you may wish to give. You believe I sat and talked with this Jeffrey Hammond and, and then shot him? Did you, Mrs. Crosby? Or rather, did you pour him the drink? No, I did not. If I had, it would deny the story to which I have sworn. It's, uh, it's only sure chance that placed the two sets of fingerprints in that position. Then you deny that you ever knew Jeffrey Hammond. You deny that you ever saw or talked with him before last night. I've sworn to that long ago. Then, Mrs. Crosby, I wish to make a brief explanation. The inquest was delayed this morning because Sergeant Jenkins made another trip to your home after you and your husband had left. Well? Mrs. Crosby, can you offer a logical explanation as to why Hammond's fingerprints were not also found on the decanter? Why were only yours found upon it? Can you explain that, Mrs. Crosby? I... You've got to let me think. There must be some reason. Yes, and the reason is that you poured that drink for Hammond. You testified you never knew him, yet the facts prove that you poured him a drink. Can you explain it? Yes! Well, I've known Jeffrey Hammond for years. He came to my house last night. We talked for a while and then... And then you shot him. Yes, I shot him. I shot him! Mrs. Coroner, Mr. Coroner, I refuse to allow my client to testify further without benefit of counsel. She may have counsel. Sergeant Jenkins, take the prisoner. Leslie Crosby, you're under arrest for the murder of Jeffrey Hammond. Mrs. Crosby? Yes. Your husband's here. Do you wish to see him? Oh, yes. Please. Five minutes, Mr. Crosby. I'll be waiting out here. Thank you. Robert. Leslie, I... I've been waiting to see you all day. They wouldn't let me come to you. You... You wanted to come, Robert? I've told Howard to take the case. Do everything he can to get you free. You... You think I can get free? He said he'd move heaven and earth. He's the finest lawyer in Singapore. If anyone can... If anyone can get you out of it, he can. If anyone can get me out of it. Do you think I need a lawyer's tricks, Robert? I don't know what you need, Leslie. Facts coming out the way they did, it made a rather bad impression. But we'll, well, we'll lick that. We'll fight together, the three of us. You're going to be loyal, aren't you, Robert? Even though I lied to you, you're going to be loyal. You've swallowed all your pride and your doubts, and you've come here to stand by me. Because you believe it's your duty. But what are you thinking, Robert? Leslie, I don't know what to think. You haven't even asked me to explain. Is it because you've already made up your mind? Because you think that Jeffrey Hammond Leslie. and I... Leslie! Don't, Leslie. Yes. I knew that was it. I saw your face in the courtroom. I felt it when you came in here. Well, you needn't torture yourself any longer, Robert. Matron! Yes? My husband is leaving. Leslie, you can't do this. I don't want an explanation. I just want you to tell me what... My husband is leaving, Matron. This way, Mr. Crosby. (laughs) 
have just heard Act One of The Letter, starring Merle Oberon, Walter Houston, Ralph Forbes, and Eric Snowden. They'll return in a moment to present Act Two. Perhaps you have wondered about the hundreds of people who come here to see as well as hear our plays on Monday nights. Who are they? Movie stars, directors, extras, and people who make their home in Hollywood. Yes, and people from back home who are visiting the entertainment headquarters of the world. Tonight, during this intermission, we are going to introduce you to a member of our audience here in the Lux Radio Theater. She's on her way to the microphone now. Her name is Mrs. Mattie Thompson. Mrs. Thompson, what are you doing here in Hollywood? I'm a visitor, Mr. Ruick. How long have you been here? Just exactly four days. Uh, where is your permanent home? In St. Joe, Missouri. Now tell us what brought you to Hollywood, Mrs. Thompson. Curiosity, I guess. I've wanted to see Hollywood for as long as I can remember. And so the first chance we got, we came. Uh, what did you want to see most in Hollywood? Well, most of all, the stars themselves. And the big studios. And I've listened to the Lux Radio Theater so many times, I was dying to see it, too. Not disappointed, I hope. Then, <laughs> no, I'm thrilled to death. Imagine me talking into the same microphone as Merle Oberon and all those other stars. I hope my friends in St. Joe are listening. Tell us, how did you get here from Missouri, by plane or train? No, we came in a trailer. Well, how do you like life in a trailer? Oh, I love it. I have everything as convenient as can be. A real little kitchen. And I cook just like I do at home. Wash dishes, too, Mr. Roy, with Lux Flakes. Take your Lux along with you, eh? I certainly do. Wouldn't be without it. Always keep a big box handy for nice things and dishes. Sometimes I don't have hot water, you know. And Lux Flakes are wonderful the way they suds up, even in cool water. I'd like to say this, too, that it's absolutely true what you tell us about Lux being better for your hands. I'm glad to hear you emphasize that, Mrs. Thompson. Yes, it's true, and last winter it was brought home to me very decidedly. I visited my sister-in-law and helped by washing dishes several days with the soap she used. It wasn't luck. In just a few days, my hands were red and chapped, and my nails looked terrible. It certainly taught me to be grateful to luck. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. We're very grateful for your loyalty to Lux Flakes. And we hope you get the most out of the rest of your stay here in Hollywood. I'm going to do my best. Fine. Now, our producer. We continue with the letter, starring Merle Oberon and Walter Houston with Ralph Forbes and Eric Snowden. It's one week later. The eve of Leslie's trial for the murder of Jeffrey Hammond. Her own lack of interest in the case has given rise to the rumor that she intends to plead guilty. Steadfastly, she has refused to see her husband or the lawyer, Howard Joyce. But now, only 12 hours before the trial's to begin, Joyce walks through the corridor and stops at Leslie's cell. Uh, that'll be all, Matron. You can let me know when the time is up. Yes, sir. Leslie. Why did you come here? I didn't ask you to come. No, Robert did. Don't turn your back, Leslie. You've got to listen to me for his sake. Life isn't very pleasant for him these days. Is it pleasant for me? You can't help things by refusing to speak. Why didn't you tell Robert that you knew Jeffrey Hammond? Why didn't you tell me? You mean, if I had, I wouldn't be here now? You'd be held in custody, yes, but not like this, not like a... Like a common murderess. You said, if I told you that I knew Jeffrey Hammond. Yet you must have known. I did know. But you wouldn't give me your confidence. Hammond mentioned your name that day he came to my office. Yes. He said he'd known you back in England. Was that true? Was it? Yes. Oh, why did he come here? Leslie, Leslie, please. I'm going to help you. But you have to help me, too. I want the whole story, Leslie. Everything. Will you tell me? Yes. It is true that... But I knew Jeffrey Hammond back in England. Years ago, long before I met Robert. Jeffrey and I, we, we were engaged to be married. Engaged? You loved him? Yes. Oh, I thought I did. I hadn't known him very long. I knew very little about him. But everything I did know made me love him more. When he asked me to marry him, he gave me a bracelet. A diamond bracelet. It was very beautiful. And I was happy to think he thought so much of me. And then one morning, I was alone in my flat. With all by
Hello, darling. Good morning, Leslie. What are you doing here in the morning? Isn't your office open? Well, I imagine so, Leslie. I've, um, I have a bit of bad news. Where's that bracelet I gave you? The bracelet? Well, I don't wear it all the time, Jeffrey. Where is it? It's in my bureau. Why? Get it. Why? Because I need it. You, you want it back? Yes. <laughs> you don't know the favor I'm doing you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Hasn't it occurred to you that it was rather an expensive bangle for a man like me to be buying? But you bought it for my engagement. I <laughs> bought it. Yes, yeah, that's good. Didn't I tell you never to wear it in public? I've only worn it once, the other night at the theater. Exactly. The one place Mark I would see it. That bracelet, my dear, was stolen. Stolen? Jeffrey, you're joking. You're not a... A thief? No, not quite. Merely, shall I say, a broker. This Mr. Markow goes by another name in the very politest society. He gave me that bracelet along with some other stolen goods to sell for him. I kept out the bracelet, sold the rest, and added a few pounds of my own. He was quite satisfied until he saw that bracelet on your arm the other night. Oh, yes, yes, he knows we were engaged. Now he believes I haven't played quite fair with him. You better give it to me, Leslie. You were going to marry me and, and then tell me this? Oh, now, Leslie. You really don't mean you didn't know? How could I know? What have you ever told me that I should know? Well, what difference does it make? You love me, don't you? Love you? How can I? Oh, nonsense. You fell in love with me, Leslie. With me, Jeffrey Hammond. That's all that matters. You'll forget about this. You will, won't you, Leslie? Yes. I'll get the bracelet for you. When he told me that, everything crumbled. I left England the same night on a boat. I didn't tell him I was going. I just packed a bag and left. It was a boat to Singapore. And that's where I met Robert. He got on the boat at Port Said. He was coming back here to the plantation... We were just shipboard acquaintances until one evening near the end of the trip. We were standing at the rail. Looking for... You see along the shore over there how the jungle comes right down to the water's edge? Well, Miss Stevens, that's... It's just like that on my rubber plantation. One moment it's cleared and civilized, and the next you're in the jungle. Well, I hope the captain steers well clear of it. I... I'd hate suddenly to find myself facing the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we have a saying out here that facing the jungle isn't as bad as facing Singapore itself. How long is it since you've been back to civilization, Mr. Crosby? If you mean England, I've never been. My father brought me out here from the States when I was a boy. After he died, I... Well, I just never found time to get back. In fact, Port Side is the farthest away I've been in all that time. I'm, uh... I'm glad, though, that I... That I had to make the trip. Why? Well, if I if I hadn't, I wouldn't have met you. How very gallant of you, Mr. Crosby. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not uh, not very much at ease with women, Miss Stevens. If I've said anything that... Uh... Oh, please don't. But I thought Singapore was full of attractive women. Yes, it is. But, uh, well, uh, well, you <laughs> you know what I mean. There, well, there are very few of the right kind of women. Most of them are married. And I suppose their husbands guard them closely against the attentions of unattached males. Such well, as you? <laughs> well, <laughs> most of the married women are smart enough not to give their husbands any cause for... Uh... Oh, now, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> I guess I have been in the wilds too long. Do you really live such a prosaic life as you've been trying to make me believe? Well, it isn't very exciting, if that's what you mean. We have a good background for romance and adventure, but our lives on the plantation are as colorless as the sap from the rubber trees. As you described your life to me last night, it didn't sound very colorless. No... Maybe you made me see it in a new light. Are you sure it wasn't just the trip? No, I'm being not. away? I'm very sure. Uh, Miss Stevens, uh, why don't you stop off as my guest at Singapore and come up to the plantation? You could stay over at my friend's, Howard Joyce and his wife. He's the best lawyer in Singapore. They'd like to have you. I know they would. Thank you, but, but I really must go on with the boat. We're only stopping a day in Singapore. But do you have to be in such a hurry? You could jump ship for a few days and catch another boat like this. That could be arranged. Do you really think it would be possible? Of course. You will stop over then? Yes. I'd like to very much. Ah, that's fine. Ah. As you know, Howard, 
Howard. I didn't catch another ship out of Singapore. You and Grace were at our wedding. You've been our closest friends. You know that Robert and I have been happy together. Apparently so happy that I never would have guessed that all along... That all along I was in love with Jeffrey Hammond? Oh, I might have thought I was for a bit. But now as I look back, I know I wasn't. But Jeffrey Hammond was the first man I fell in love with. And that peculiar quirk in human nature always kept him in my mind. I never told Robert. There was never any reason to tell him. And then... And then Hammond found you. Yes. Quite by accident, I'm sure. He had no idea I was in Singapore. It was late one afternoon. I'd come into Singapore on the car with Robert. He went to your office to discuss something about buying a new plantation. Chung drove me on in the car for some shopping. We stopped at the market and he went in to buy some supplies. I was sitting there alone in the car. Good afternoon, Mrs. Crosby. Jeffrey. <laughs> How are you, Leslie? Surprised to see me? What are you doing in Singapore? Oh, now, Mrs. Crosby, is that a fair question? To ask a man why he comes to Singapore. I remember the code of the East and all that sort of thing. How did you know my name? Your name? Oh, I've seen you once or twice. I know you married a very rich plantation owner. Very rich. What do you mean? <laughs> why, I, I thought I'd come to call. Always wanted to see how rich plantation owners and their wives live. Jeffrey, you mustn't come. You hear me? You mustn't. Are you ashamed of me? Ashamed of your old sweetheart? Well, of course, my clothes aren't any too good. London police were most inconsiderate. They gave me no time to pack. By the way, they were looking for you, too. They seemed to think you were involved in a little matter of a stolen necklace. Jeffrey? <laughs> Jeffrey? Who is this woman? What do you mean by hanging around? Go on. Who is this lady? Oh. Oh, this, this lady. Let me introduce you. Uh, Leslie, may I present my little friend, Lee T? Very charming girl, aren't you, Lee T? Now run along. No. You come. Oh, in a moment, my dear. Well, Leslie, when shall I come to call? Jeffrey, you can't. Well, don't you think your husband would like to see me? I should think we've got a great deal in common. You can't do this. I've been happy here. My husband loves me. I did too, my dear. But I need money. A great deal of money. Goodbye, Leslie. I hope my foot hasn't soiled the running board of your pretty automobile. <laughs> Come along, Lee. I saw everything shattered again. My life here, my love for Robert and his love for me. I saw Jeffrey several times on the street. I tried to plead with him, but he only laughed and kept hinting about what he'd tell Robert. I couldn't stand it any longer. I sent for him that night. Robert was away. I wanted to ask him once more to please let me alone. He came about ten. I saw at once that he'd been drinking. He made me pour him a glass from the decanter. Your liquor is very good, Leslie. Very expensive, I imagine. May I have another, please? Haven't you had enough? Please go. Oh, I say, you're not very hospitable, Leslie. You asked me, here's your guests, and then you... I asked you here for one purpose only. To beg you to let me alone. Now, Leslie, be reasonable. You know how fond I've always been of you. Would you deprive me of the pleasure of your company? You don't want my company. You want money. Well, one can always use money. This is blackmail. You're a blackmailer. <laughs> I've been called worse without being frightened or offended. Jeffrey, please. I have no money. If I had, I'd give it to you gladly. Anything, anything just to be left in peace. But I'm not rushing you, my dear. You may have time. All you want. Very well. I'll get some money somewhere. But then you've got to promise to go away. For good. Oh, of course, of course. Meantime, we can still be friends. Good friends. We can't. Why? We were good friends once. You haven't forgotten? You must stay away from here. If my husband found you... Oh, uh -huh, yes. Husband's a very jealous man, isn't he? Then we mustn't let the husband know. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you, Leslie. And me. I... I don't... Oh, he must never know you sent for me, did I? No, that wouldn't do, would it? Because then he'd think we waited for him to be away. And then he'd see you'd give me a drink. And then... Well, then he'd look into your eyes. And find that you really love me. You're mad. I don't love you. Not now, not anymore. You can't change, Leslie. 
You loved me once. Let me go. I'll never let you go. Don't touch me. Put me down. <laughs> oh, Red. You should have told me about that, that being there. Might have hurt you. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Don't move, Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah, unfortunate my falling like that. Gave impulsive little Leslie a chance to reach for her husband's gun. But you can't frighten me, my dear. Suppose the houseboy hears you shoot me. After you sent for me. Sent for me as a guest. Stand back. <laughs> Robert will be awfully jealous that he didn't get invited, too. <laughs> <laughs> I shot him. Then I called the police. You know the rest. Then it was purely in self-defense that you killed him. Yes, but they won't believe me. We can try it. You knew Hammond will grant that point. You were alone. He came to see you. He was drunk. He threatened you, and you shot him. If they believe that, that's all you'll need to clear you. We won't even mention that you were once in love with him. No one need know that. Not even Robert. You see now why I couldn't tell him? I see. Now, one point, Leslie... You say you sent for Geoffrey Hammond by messenger? No, I wrote him a letter. A letter? Where is it? Did you get it back? No, he probably destroyed it. There was no reason why he should keep it. Probably not. Just the same, I wish you had it. Your time's up, Mr. Joyce. Oh, in a moment. I'll be here to see you in the morning before the trial. I think we stand a fair chance. But you'll have to be brave for Robert's sake as well as your own. I will, for Robert's sake. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The second act of the letter is over. Merle Oberon, Walter Houston, and our all-star cast will continue in a moment with Act Three. This intermission is highlighted by the presence of a man very familiar with the scenes of our play. He is Carveth Wells, who flew to Hollywood from his Bermuda home to bring us some strange facts about far-off melee, where this action of our play occurs. A noted explorer, Mr. Wells is author of ten books, including the bestseller, Six Years in the Melee Jungle. And since Mrs. Wells accompanies her husband on all his expeditions, we're happy to have her with us also. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Actually, I feel even closer to the Lux Radio Theater than Carth does. What do you mean? I hear this program every chance I get, and I think it's tops. But what I mean is this. Being a woman, I'm a little more familiar with the product behind this program, Lux Flakes. I know how much Lux means to women all over the world. And if I say nothing else, I'm glad to have injected my little piece in praise of it. Oh, it's one we've been very happy to hear. And now what can you say in praise of melee? I've heard some strange tales of fish who climb trees and wink their eyes while they do it. <laughs> well, that's absolutely true. Uh, when nature came to melee, she must have gone on a kind of a spree. I've seen seagoing monkeys who wade into the surf and catch crabs, eat them, and then clean their teeth afterward. And I shot a full-grown Malay deer, carried it home in my pocket, and cooked the whole beast in a frying pan. And there's a bird in Malay who feeds his wife on strychnine. You would notice that, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's true. And it's also a fact that butterflies in Malay are as big as dinner plates. Spider webs are strong enough to catch birds, and I've even heard an earthworm sing. What was the song? Wiggle while you work? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's hard to believe, what would you say about this? If you chase a Malay lizard, it breaks off its tail, and the tail starts hopping about in order to distract your attention while the lizard itself escapes. In about two weeks, the lizard sprouts another tail. 
You, uh, you sprout some splendid tales yourself, Mr. Wells. <laughs> what's, our, what's the next one? <laughs> My dear, I don't think we're appreciated around here. Well, it is awfully hard to believe some of these things unless you're there and see them for yourself. But here's something, Mr. DeMille, that I can prove. Here are some examples of real Malay silk. These are typical sarongs worn by the Malay women who love brilliant colors such as these purples, scarlets, and blues. We've shown these sarongs hundreds of times in all part of, parts of America. They have been worn by models 15,000 times. And there's no mystery why they look so fresh and new after all that wear. They have been washed hundreds of times and always in luxe flakes. And while I wish we could show you other tangible facts from Malay, Mr. DeMille, what impressed me most about the place was something that couldn't be seen. The complete mystery that grips not only the jungle, but even the plantations. And then it's your opinion that the strange, weird accounts coming out of the Far East are not always the tall stories of imaginative travelers. Well, after spending six years in Malay, Mr. DeMille, all I can say is that I now believe a person's thoughts and actions are controlled largely by environment. And in the environment of that Malay jungle, I think almost anything can happen. That's why I'm anxious to hear the third act of tonight's play. I'm told it has a real climax. So let you and I get back to the Malay jungle and let Mr. DeMille get back to the letter. I guess that she is the boss, Mr. DeMille. Goodbye. And thanks for having us. Thank you for bringing adventure to our door. Once again, the letter... Starring Merle Oberon and Walter Houston with Ralph Forbes and Eric Snowden. <laughs> Leslie's trial is over. Behind locked doors, the jury weighs the evidence. As the hours crawl by, Robert paces the corridor nervously. Suddenly he stops and turns to Howard Joyce. Why are they out there so long? What are they doing in there? Easy, Bob. But she was telling the truth. Anyone could see that. She knew Hammond only casually. He forced his way into the house and threatened her. That jury blind? You can't expect them to feel as you do, Bob. You believe her, don't you? <sighs> of course I do. I think she'll be glad to hear that. All I want to do is to get her out of this place. Take her home and help her to forget. Oh, I was a fool ever to have doubted her. You're sure of the verdict, Howard? Practically. Hammond picked up a rather bad reputation for himself in Singapore. I think she'll be freed, Bob. Yeah, that's all I want now. I'll get her away and I'll take her up to the Phillips plantation. You can put through that deal, Howard. Five thousand pounds is a lot of money. Well, what of it? I've always wanted the place. Now I want it even more. For Leslie's sake. Mr. Joyce? I beg your pardon? I wish to speak with you, please. Oh, I'm sorry, but I... I wish to speak with you alone. My name is Lee T. Oh. Oh, yes. Uh, excuse me, Bob. It's rather important. Yes, of course. Uh, this way, please. There's a room over here we can use. Well, what is it, please? I think you know already, Mr. Joyce. Do I? That was a very, very clever way to defend Mrs. Crosby, Mr. Joyce. It was the truth. But not all truth. You see, I knew Mr. Hammond very well. Yes? Go on, please. As Mrs. Crosby's lawyer, you must know that on night Jeffrey Hammond went to Mrs. Crosby's house, he went because she sent for him. Did she? That would not be good for a jury to know. How do you know it? I was with him. When letter came. If you testify to that, it'll only be the testimony of a jealous woman. There are any number of ways to discredit your story. Do you understand? But there is one way to prove it. I have letter. Let me see it. Read it, please. <laughs> it's not even in her handwriting. <laughs> you did not think I would bring original with me? This is coffee. What do you think of letter, Mr. Joyce? It's an entirely innocently written note. Yes, Mr. Joyce. 
but it can be read in other way. Let me read it to you. Jeffrey, I must see you tonight. My husband will be away. If you live, do not come too near the house, for the servants might hear your car. In the name of the love I once held for you, I ask that you do not fail me, Leslie. <laughs> you see, Mr. Joyce, when you read it, you read it as her friend. What do you want for the original of this? Five thousand pounds. Five thousand pounds? Oh, that's ridiculous. Crosby hasn't got it. Was he not paying five thousand pounds for plantation of Mr. Philip? That is what I learned. Five thousand pounds is my price for letter. And my... Silence. It's all the money he has in the world. Does not Mr. Crosby love his wife that much? Perhaps I should have asked him instead of you. Where is the original? At my home. You will accept my offer? I must talk with Mrs. Crosby. If you'll meet me here in half an hour, I'll know whether the money can be paid or not. In half an hour, then, Mr. Joyce? Good day. And that's the amount she asks, Leslie. Five thousand pounds. Robert's lifelong savings. Must it be bought? You have the note as she copied it. It's a true copy, isn't it? Yes. She could reopen the case with this. It would look very bad. I wish I could advance you the money and then say forget it, but I can't, Leslie. Robert will have to know you paid it. He told me to go the limit. It's not that I'm thinking of. You wonder how he will read it. Yes. Pay her, Howard. Buy the letter from her. I've gambled this far on Robert's understanding. And if he doesn't understand... Perhaps you can guess, Howard. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. The defendant will rise. Gentlemen of the jury, what is your verdict? Not guilty. See, Leslie, I had Chung and the boys change the room all around. I... I did... I did everything to make it look different, Leslie. Or is it so much change that it only makes you remember that night? I'll only remember that you thought so much of me you wanted to change it, Robert. It's just like starting all over again. Leslie, was I so awfully jealous? Was I? I was to blame for it, Robert. No, no, no you weren't. But I'm going to make it up to you now, darling. You'll see. I'm going to make you so happy that you'll, you'll never remember it happened. <laughs> oh, Robert. What is it, Leslie? Nothing. Nothing. I'm so happy now. I'm going to take you away from here, Leslie. As soon as I get things straightened out, we're going north. North? Yes. To the Phillips Plantation. I've had that on my mind a long time. I've decided to buy it. Definitely. But, but why? You've made this place. It was nothing when you came here. It's like, it's like your child. Oh, I hate it now. I hate every tree on it. I want to get away, and so must you. But the risk, a new plantation. It's no risk, darling. It's like a gold mine. Here, look. I have some photographs of it. You can see... No, no, please, Robert. Not now. I don't want to see them now. What's the matter? Take me out into the garden. I want to be alone with you for the next hour. I want to walk with you, laugh with you, hold your arm. For the next hour? I've only got an hour alone with you, Robert. I've invited the Joyce's over for dinner. I want you to settle with Howard tonight. The first night you're home... Oh, Leslie, I thought... Please understand, Robert. But there's plenty of time. There's never plenty of time for anything. It all goes so quickly. Leslie. Even the next hour. Mm. 
What's the matter, Howard? Doesn't the noise of this shaker cheer you up? Perhaps I need some of the contents. <laughs> You've been around with a long face ever since you and Grace came out. Or are you just hungry? I'm sorry. How's this face? Better? No, very little. Well, we're ready. Where are the wives? Leslie? Oh, Leslie? I thought they were out here on the porch. No, I think I saw them go into the garden a few minutes ago. Mm, then they'll have to miss this round. <clears throat> By the way, I'll uh, cheer you up a little. What's it going to cost me, Howard? Oh, wait till tomorrow. Forget it tonight. Just be happy with Leslie. No, no, I think Leslie arranged for these few minutes. She wants it settled. Oh, well, we can wait until tomorrow or later in the week. Business is business, Howard. May as well get the money while you can. Most of it will be gone soon on the Phillips plantation. Well, how much is your fee? Very well. Nothing for my personal services. Oh, no, no, wait, wait. We're friends and all that, but... Uh... But uh, there was an additional out-of-the-pocket expense. Well, I told you to spend anything you had to. How much? I'm afraid it's going to be stiff. <sighs> all right. I'm holding on to the table. Come on, how much? Five thousand pounds. Five thousand... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Why? I, I almost believed you for a moment. That's what I must ask, Bob. Mm. <laughs> want to clean me out, eh? <laughs> sure you don't want the plantation, too. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have put the Phillips matter in your hands, eh? Well, Howard? <laughs> Why don't you laugh? Are you serious? I wish I weren't. I haven't too much money myself, you know, or I'd let it pass for a while. Why are you holding me up like this? Bob, Bob, please. But 5,000 pounds. Did you call before, Robert? Yes, I think you ought to be in on Howard's little joke, too, Leslie. It seems he paid an out-of-the-pocket expense of 5,000 pounds. Did, uh, did you know anything about it? Yes, Robert. Then it... it isn't a joke. No, Robert. What was it for? It was for a letter I wrote. It might have shown up badly at the trial. We had to buy it to keep it out of the evidence. Five thousand pounds for a letter? It must have been pretty damaging. It was. But not in the way you think. Well, what was it? Would you... Would you like to see it, Robert? For five thousand pounds? Why not? Do you have it with you, Howard? Yes. Here. Give it to Robert, please. Now leave us, Howard. You're sure there's nothing I can do? Quite sure. Thank you. You haven't opened it. You, uh, bought this letter to keep it out of the evidence. Is that, uh, right, Leslie? Yes. Because it might be misunderstood. Yes. Is that all, Leslie? Is that the only reason? That's the only reason, Robert. Hmm. Then, uh, then maybe if I read this letter, I might misunderstand it, too. Will you hold that candlestick for me, Leslie? I think we'd better burn this. Oh, Robert. Steady, dear. Steady. There. It's gone. Robert. Darling. And that, ladies and gentlemen, rings down the curtain on tonight's play. However, in just a moment, Merle Oberon and Walter Houston will return with Mr. DeMille. At this point, may I remind you that next week is National Cotton Week, and your own favorite store will feature new cotton fabrics which are smarter, more beautiful in color and design than ever before. These new cottons and linens are really fine fabrics, and you will see them made up in all sorts of exciting new fashions, from fascinating town and country frocks to formal evening dresses. You'll enjoy wearing them because they look so fresh and so summery. And because with Lux Flakes, they'll stay lovely looking so long. Hundreds of leading stores advise their customers to use Lux Flakes. And it's wise economy to follow this advice. You can depend upon the famous Lux promise. If it's safe in water alone, 
It's safe in Lux. Here is Mr. DeMille. The stars of the letter return now in a brief postscript. I have special thanks for Walter Houston, not only for his performance tonight, but for the distinction with which he replaced me as producer of this theater while I was in the hospital a few weeks ago. And I'm no less grateful to Miss Oberon for choosing the Lux Radio Theater for her first public appearance since returning from England. While there, she figured conspicuously in three smashes. One was in an automobile, two in motion pictures. And we hope, Miss Oberon, that from now on, your hits will be confined to the screen or radio. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, Walter, I was quite surprised to learn from Mr. DeMille that you're a native of Canada. I've always taken you for a typical Yankee. Oh, you mean because I have that fine, virile profile, that strong, silent look <laughs> that... Uh... Yes, 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 yes. But chiefly, I think, because, uh, because you have the cutest Adam's apple. Hmm. It's not an apple, it's a grapefruit. <laughs> but uh, tell us, Merle, what about your experiences in England? Well, after all, Walter, there's nothing like experience. Well, that's very interesting. Would you care to uh, commit yourself any further, Miss Oprah? <laughs> yes, aside from being featured in an automobile wreck, most of my time was spent before the camera. I made two pictures over there. One called uh, The Divorce of Lady X and the other Over the Moon. Uh, tell me they're your first comedies. Yes, and in case my acting shows it too plainly, they've bolstered the pictures with some really splendid technicolor. Over the Moon, as far as I know, is the first feature picture in which Paris, Venice, London, Switzerland, Monte Carlo are all seen in color. Tonight's play, Merle, must have brought back to you many memories of the colorful scenes of India. Yes, Mr. DeMille. But I've never been in Singapore. The closest connection I have with the letter is the fact that I happen to be quite a close friend of the author's daughter. But now about you, Walter. How did you like taking Mr. DeMille's place here as producer? Well, Merle, I thought it was great until after I got home. I drove back to where I live. That's about a hundred miles from here up in the mountains. I was feeling kind of proud of myself, and I walked over to one of my neighbors and finally got around to, you know, asking him how he liked the show. Well, he said he thought Deanna Durbin was just about the best thing he'd ever heard. I said, well, that's fine. Now, how did you like the, uh, well, you know, the program as a whole, the way it was uh, put together, the production and so on? And he thought that was everything considered it was pretty good. But you know, Mr. Houston, he added, there was something awfully queer about it. They had some man on there trying to take Mr. DeMille's place, and if I was you, I'd do something about it on account he was using your name. <laughs> what did you do, Walter? I went home and built another chair. <laughs> An amateur carpenter, eh? Yeah, so far, but if I get any more comments like my neighbors, I think I'll turn professional. Good night, CB. <laughs> Good night, Mr. DeMille, and many thanks. Good night, Merle. Good night, Walter. Thank you. None of you will want to miss the thrilling announcement about next week's program to be made by Mr. DeMille in just a moment. Ralph Forbes, who played Jeffrey Hammond tonight, is featured in the new Paramount picture, If I Were King. Louis Silvers appeared tonight through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Kidnapped. Our cast tonight included Leonard Mudy as Coroner Bentley, Raymond Lawrence as Sergeant Jenkins, Lou Merrill as Chung, Celeste Rush as Lee T., Sybil Harris as the matron, and Frank Nelson as foreman. And now we want to join in the celebration of National Foreign Trade Week. Certainly, everyone who has the welfare of our country at heart must naturally be interested in increasing our share of foreign trade. So here's wishing an ever-growing development of this very important phase of our country's business life. Mr. DeMille. Every now and then, a drama comes quietly to the screen. And without fanfare or ballyhoo, is suddenly recognized as one of the year's most enjoyable pictures. Such a play we bring you next Monday night. I Met My Love Again. The story of a love greater than circumstance and stronger than time. In our production will be heard the same two stars seen in the film. The lovely Joan Bennett and the very popular Henry Fonda. Also that distinguished character actress, Mae Robeson. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Bennett and Henry Fonda with Mae Robeson in I Met My Love Again. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood.
announcer has been Melville Rui. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.